Welcome. This is a ResNet Florida test options webinar, and my name is Paul Morin with the Energy Conservatory. And we have a few housekeeping things to go over before we start. If you do not hear anything from your computer speaker system, you'll need to dial in and uh, listen to the presentation over the phone. On, on the right side there, you'll see the audio section along with a phone number. And, um, and you can dial in and listen to the webinar that way. If you have a question for a presenter during the webinar, please type your message in the question box on the right portion of the screen. There's a little plus sign. If you click on that, it'll open up that question box. And feel free to, to type in a question. And we'll be responding to, um, to some of those questions. Type back uh, responses to those as the webinar goes along. If you have um, any comments for the audience you'd like to add to the um, add to the webinar, please type the message in the chat box on the right portion of your screen. You'll see that um, right below the um, the question box. And these these uh, session slides and the webinar will be on the uh, Energy Conservatory website soon. The agenda of what we're going to cover will. We'll, uh, Refer generally to the previous ResNet Floater standard, the revised uh, ResNet test options, performing manual tests, performing automated tests, and preparing the building envelope. Previous ResNet standard referred to, pointed to ASHRAE 119, which gives us two test options, the ASTM E779, and the CGSB149 uh, um, were the two standards it pointed to. The uh, ASTM E779 required five pressurization data points, five depressurization data points, uh, temperature and altitude correction, and, and a report including the leakage coefficient pressure exponent for both pressurization and depressurization, the effective leakage area, and the mean standard deviation of the mean and uncertainty of the test. Um, CGSB 149 included eight depressurization data points, uh, temperature correction, and then those other things uh, required in a report similar to E779. So um, not a lot of trainers were, were training. This is the requirement. Um, not many people were doing this test. However, some people were doing automated eight-point tests in the field. Uh, but this was the requirement before January of 2012. Um, the new revised ResNet standard um, that was effective January of 2012 um, has has a simplified, more practical way to determine the accuracy of the test. And I think you'll agree after we go through these things that um, this will be easier than what the previous standard was and um, um, it should be practical enough so you'll be able to follow it without any trouble. Um, Clothes do need to be adjusted for temperature and elevation under some situations. We'll go over that. Um, it's possible to do the test without software, where previously uh, it wouldn't have been. Um, and you have three test options. Uh, you can do a single point test, multi-point test, or a repeated single point test. And we'll go over those in some detail. Um, tests may be depressurization or pressurization. You can do either one. Um, we'll fo focus mainly on the single point test, but we will cover multi point and repeated test um, in, in the automated um, section of the webinar. Um, you can, as I mentioned, do the test without software. You can gather the data in the field and use the temperature charts and an elevation formula um, to do those calculations without software. Um, you can also do it with software. You can do a manual data entry. So you can gather the data manually, enter it into either the Tektite 4.0 software or the iTech ResNet iPhone app manually, or you can do an automated test using the Tektite 4.0 software. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll find after after doing this, if you try an automated test, um, I think you'll find in the long run that's going to be easier. You, 
the calculations happen automatically and you will have uh, um, you have a report that you can print off that's pretty slick. Um, so the, the no software uh, data gathering, you have to record five 10 second average baseline readings. And, and those baseline readings, um, when you're not using software, are only used to de determine the level of accuracy. Um, then you'll perform the baseline test like you normally do, um, and you'll adjust for temperature using charts for elevation using the formula. And we do have a, a quick guide um, and a test form for collecting that data for a manual one-point test. Um, and you, then you'll determine the level of accuracy uh, from the baseline readings. You'll determine the baseline range, the difference between the highest and lowest reading. If that range is less than 5 pascals, it's considered a standard level of accuracy. Between 5 and 10, a reduced level of accuracy greater than 10, um, the one, one point test can't be used. Um, so we'll determine the baseline range, the difference between the lowest and highest reading. So if we have, if, if our um, lowest reading is negative 2 and our highest reading is positive 2, the difference between 2, negative 2 and positive 2 is 4. Um, so you can think of it as 2 minus a negative 2, and minus a negative is a positive, or, or you can think of it in absolute value. Um, but the easiest way, at least what I find um, is easiest for me, is to visualize it on a number line. Um, difference between negative 2, you first have to go to 0, which is 2, and then to a positive 2, which is 2 more. So that range would be 4. Um, if, if your um, range is more than 5 pascals, you can, you can repeat the test with a longer baseline um, average. So you could go to maybe 30 second average, write down 5 30 second average readings, and that'll tend to tighten the, tighten the range up, and uh, you're more likely to get uh, a range number of less than five pascals that way, and uh, and then when you do the blower dart test, you'll do a 30 second average on that also. Um, otherwise, you, you would uh, you would you, you have the option of doing a multi point test or a repeated single point test to determine the, the level of accuracy. Um, so if you're not doing the test, like we mentioned, turn on the gauge, set the mode to CFM at 50, uh, configure the, the ring setting, cover the fan inlet, and enter a 10-second baseline period. So you'll, um, you'll, you'll uh, push baseline, and on the B channel, it'll be counting up to 10 seconds. As it counts, it counts seconds along, once it gets to 10, you'll enter that. Um, that baseline period in. Um, then you'll bring the, the house up to 50. Uh, then you'll change the averaging period to 10 seconds. Now you want to record a 10 second average. So, um, so you'll change the uh, um, time averaging to 10 seconds and record the 10 second average. And then you'll need to adjust for temperature. Um, Indoor and outdoor temperatures need an accuracy of 10%. They can be omitted if the temperature is less than 30. So if the temperature difference between inside and outside is less than 30, then, then you don't need to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's say um, you've got a temperature of, uh, of zero, uh, like we do sometimes in January in Minneapolis, um, and it's 65 indoors you got uh, 0.887 as a multiplier, so um, more than a 10% correction. So um, you can definitely have big um, temperature corrections uh, when you have extreme temperatures. Um, and there are both positive and negative pressure charts. So this is uh, these are the correction factors for depressurization testing for the negative pressure, and there's also uh, um, another chart for pressurization testing. An example, um, 
using uh, 85 degrees outside and um, 75 degrees inside, we would have 1.022 would be our correction factor, 2,000 times that correction factor, um, 2044, so about a 2.2% correction uh, at 85 degrees. Elevation correction, if we have more than uh, 5,000 um, feet above sea level, and uh, then you have to do the temperature or the uh, altitude correction and you need to record the accuracy within 2,000 feet. And then here's the formula for the correction factor. 1 plus point, uh, five zeros and a 6 times the altitude in feet. And then you'll multiply that by the CFM at 50. Uh, an example at 6,000 feet, uh, you'll end up with uh, 2072. CFM at 50. Um, so then the corrected CFM is the CFM times the altitude correction times the temperature correction factor. Um, so in this case, we have 2,000 um, times uh, our um, temperature correction factor times our altitude correction factor, and we end up at 2118 CFM. Um, if we're doing a manual um, data entry into the software, we'll take the information uh, a little bit differently. Um, we'll take five 10 second averages and those 10 second averages will double as our baseline reading. So um, we don't use the baseline function of the gauge or the CFM50 function. Uh, we'll set the DG in the pressure flow mode. Um, after we take the 10 uh, Five second averages, we'll set the gauge back to one second. We won't use the baseline function, our CFM features of the gauge. Um, then um, we'll, after we get the, uh, the house up at 50, we'll record uh, um, a 10 second um, unadjusted pressure and flow. So we have the, the um, set the gauge back to 10 second averages bring the house up after we bring the house up to 50 and um, record the, that un unadjusted pressure and flow reading. And then the software, uh, we can use software to generate a report 